Hello anatomists and welcome to two of the most fascinating systems of the body, the lymphatic system and the immune system. I'm going to divide this presentation into three main parts, then I'm going to go back and summarize the cells, all the cells that we discussed in a nice table, and then finally I'm going to test your knowledge with five good test questions. So the first part is going to be the lymphatic system and we'll cover what the lymphatic structures are, what lymph actually is, how it's formed, what's the path it takes throughout the body, and where it ends up. Second, I'll take you through the innate system, which is the first line of defense, or you can say the nonspecific defenses like skin, mucous membranes, the involved cells like natural killer cells and phagocytes, as well as inflammation and fever. Third, I'll take you through the an adaptive immune system and I'll cover sp specifically how the different T cells and B cells and dendritic cells carry out their coordinated attacks and we'll touch on allergies as well. Lastly, I'll take you all the way back to the beginning and we'll go through, we'll summarize one more time all the cells of the immune system, both the innate and the adaptive in a nice table and then I will test your knowledge with five good test questions. All right, let's get this party started. So here's a quick overview of the lymphatic system. It consists of number one, lymphatic vessels, also a fluid called lymph, and also a number of lymphatic structures and organs containing lymphatic tissue. And then finally, it consists of bone marrow where stem cells develop into various types of blood cells. When blood finally reaches the systemic capillaries, now you remember we, we, we've already gone through the, 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 the circulatory system, the cardiovascular system. So we know how the, the, the blood cycles through the body. So when the blood finally reaches the systemic capillaries, it's dest in other words, its destination, you know, to bring nutrients to cells, the liquid portion of blood the plasma, like water, plasma proteins, and some solutes, percolates through the walls and into the interstitial fluid to be available for cells. It is then picked up by lymphatic capillaries and now is called lymph. Lymph travels through the lymphatic vessels and then lymph nodes to be cleaned and back to the circulatory system. The lymphatic system really is an intricate network of vessels picking up dirty plasma to be cleaned and dumped back into the circulatory system at the subclavian veins. Here are the four main functions of the lymphatic system. First, it returns plasma and plasma proteins which have escaped from the capillaries back into the bloodstream. It also filters body fluids like blood and lymph of bacteria, viruses, fungi, parasites, cancer cells, dead cells, and then destroys them through white blood cells in the lymph nodes and tonsils and spleen. It also has in the immunity aspect where lymph nodes, red bone marrow, tonsils, the thymus gland, and the spleen produce white blood cells which protect us from disease. And then finally, it absorbs the end products of fat digestion. We're talking the long chain fatty acids and monoglycerides and the fat soluble vitamins from the small intestine and then transports them back into the bloodstream, thus the milky appearance that it has. So I'll take you through the pathway of the escaped plasma back to the blood in five main steps. First, we have lymphatic capillaries and that's what you're seeing here. The collected escaped plasma and plasma proteins and microbes and dead cells inside the lymph capillaries is now called lymph. So what you're seeing here is, uh, is, is a lymphatic capillary. And imagine um, the, 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 the circulatory system, how it delivers blood to the cells. The plasma leaks into the interstitial fluid and that's how, it, that's how nutrients get delivered to the cells. Well, well, that plasma has to go back to the circulatory system. So it can either be picked up again by the blood capillaries or by the lymphatic capillaries. So the lymphatic capillary system, I mean the lymphatic system really is a one-way uh, a one-way street. Some of that some of that plasma gets picked up by the lymphatic system. So that's what we're seeing here. This is a it's a it's a one-way street whereas with the 
the circulatory system, you, it's, it's a, it's a two-way street. I mean, it goes, it goes up and it's a, it's a cycle. It's a, cir it's, it's cyclic. The lymphatic vessels begin as close-ended lymphatic capillaries located in between cells in the blood capillary beds. Just as blood capillaries converge to form venules and then to veins, lymphatic capillaries look very similar but have a slightly larger diameter, slightly thinner walls, and even more valves than veins do. The simple squamous endothelial epithelial cells, which make up the capillary wall, overlap each other like flap-like valves, making them very permeable. So when pressure is greater in the interstitial fluid than in the lymph, which is in the lymphatic um, capillaries, the cells separate slightly like a swinging door and fluid is forced in. Once the pressure inside the capillary exceeds that of the interstitial fluid, the cells adhere once again more closely and then nothing escapes. The pressure is relieved as lymph moves up through the vessel. The lymphatic system is generally depicted in the color green. So the second step of the pathway of the escape plasma is the afferent lymphatic vessels. So now the afferent lymphatic vessels bring dirty lymph towards a lymph node. And their structure is like veins, the, the same three tunicas and and, and valves. So first we have the lymphatic capillaries that pick up this escaped plasma and then these lymphatic capillaries converge to form afferent lymphatic vessels and why, is, why are they called afferent? Afferent meaning going towards. Going towards what? Going towards the heart? No, not necessarily. They're, it's going towards a, a lymph node. The third step is the lymph node themselves. The lymph nodes are located along the lymphatic vessels there and they are in line with each other. Finally, and, and of course this is where we're going to focus with the immune system, then we're going we're to focus on what's going on with the T cells and B cells inside the lymph nodes. Okay, but, but, but um, let's first get through the, the, the lymphatic here. And then finally, they send the lymph nodes, then they send cleaned lymph into the efferent lymphatic vessels, which is, why is it called efferent? Because it's going away from the lymph node. So you have, so first you have the lymphatic capillaries picking, first picking up the, the, the dirty plasma, converging into afferent lymphatic vessels, going towards the lymph node, step three, lymph nodes, and then it gets cleaned a little bit, you know, a little bit of it gets cleaned and then it exits out the efferent lymphatic vessels. And so these guys carry clean lymph away from the lymph nodes. And their structure is like veins, the same three tunicas. And they merge with other lymph efferent lymphatic vessels to form the fifth step, which is the lymph trunks. The, these drain lymph from large regions of the body and the principal trunks I'm not going to ask you to memorize uh, all, all, all of these um, all five of these lymph trunks but they are the lumbar tr lymph trunk intestinal bronchiomediastinal subclavian jugular trunks I won't ask you to to memorize all those different ones just know that step five are the lymph trunks and then finally they pass their lymph into one of two collecting ducts. And here I'm going to want you to pause a second and memorize a little bit of stuff here, understand a little bit of stuff. The two collecting ducts are one, the thoracic duct, and second, the right lymphatic duct. The thoracic duct collects lymph from the left side of the head, left chest, left arm, and everything below the ribs. So I want you to know that there are two collecting ducts and that the thoracic duct collects all the lymph from the left head, left chest, left arm, and everything below the ribs. And then, it, and then I also want you to know where it ends up dumping all the lymph into. The thoracic duct ends up emptying its lymph into the left subclavian vein. 
All right, and then the second, uh, the, the, the second collecting duct is called the right lymphatic duct. This now collects from everything else, the right head, the right chest, and the right arm. And it empties into the right subclavian vein. So that's the, that's the, uh, the, the thoracic duct and the right lymphatic duct. And you can see here, it's, if you can kind of, you know, look, a little, look, look closely, you see the right lymphatic duct over there. You see the, the, the thoracic duct and you see them dumping into the right subclavian vein and the left sub, subclavian vein. Three liters of plasma a day drains into these lymphatic vessels to become lymph. Because most plasma proteins are too large, to leave blood capillaries in the first place, interstitial fluid contains only a small amount of proteins. Proteins that do enter the interstitial fluid cannot return to the blood by diffusion because of that high concentration gradient inside the blood capillaries. Proteins can, however, move readily through the more permeable lymphatic capillaries. So you can see how the, in the lymphatic capillaries, you can see how the cells can separate when pressure is greater outside and then they adhere once again when pressure inside is greater. That way lymph continues to move in the correct direction. Now there's a, there's, there's a couple ways how this happens. First of all, it's the first is by the milking action of skeletal muscle contraction, especially of the legs. It's the same idea as in the circulatory system, like your gastrocnemius. When you squeeze those, when you basically when you walk, not necessarily when you stand or when you sit, but when you're walking, when you're contracting and relaxing, contracting and relaxing. This compresses the lymphatic vessels, just like the veins, back up against gravity. And the second thing, lymph flow is also maintained by pressure changes that occur during inhalation, when you breathe in and breathe out. Lymph flows from the abdominal region, where pressure is higher, toward the thoracic region, where it's lower. When you breathe out, the pressure reverses and the lymph attempts to flow back down but the valves shut. So every time you breathe in, lymph goes up, and every time you breathe out, lymph tries to flow back down. But of course, there's 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 valves in the lymph cap in the lymph vessels, just like there is in the um, in the circulatory in the in the veins in the vent in the venous system. There are a couple of percentages that I'm I want you to be familiar with. Ninety percent of the escaped plasma and plasma proteins that have escaped from the circulatory system go right back into the circulatory system. Nothing new here. We've, we've, we, it's just like what we've already covered. However, 10% of the escaped plasma and plasma proteins remains in the intercellular spa spaces until it is picked up by lymphatic capillaries of the lymphatic system. The lymphatic system will then transport this escaped plasma and plasma pro proteins back into the blood stream up at the top. If this escaped plasma would remain in the intercellular spaces, edema follows poor gas exchange and, and waste between blood cells and it can be lethal within 24 hours. All right, let's, let's talk a little bit about uh, the, the, the lymph node. We have around 600 lymph nodes located along these lymphatic vessels and they are in line with each other. They usually, f they, they usually are found in, in clusters. So you have like, you know, your, your submandibular clusters, you have your cervical lymph nodes uh, under, you know, under the neck there, you have your ax axillary under the armpits, you have your abdominal, pelvic, inguinal, and so when the, um, you know, when you go to the doctor and the doctor is feeling under the neck or under under your arm, they're generally feeling for swollen. They're they're feeling for those cervical or or, or submandibular axillary, because if they're swollen, it means that you have an infection. The lymph nodes are working overtime. The lymph node is bean shaped. It's like between. Uh, 
you know, uh, it can, they, can, they can be as, as big as an inch long. Um, and they're covered by a capsule par partitioned by invaginations of the capsule and called trabeculae, which divide the node into compartments. So I want you to be familiar with a couple of things here. One, the shape, the orientation of the lymph node and how, and, and, and how the vessels are attached to this lymph node. And also what kind of cells and in general kind of where are they in the, in, in the lymph node. So let's draw the lymph nodes in the shape like a heart where you kind of have the, the apex at the bottom there. So if you can, I think it'll be really helpful if you get some paper out and draw with me one lymph node. We'll go through all the structures, all the regions inside the lymph node, as well as the cells that we find inside of the lymph node. So first, as we know, it sort of looks like a bean. A little bean shape. like that. We have lymphatic vessels on both sides here. Just like that. Let's do some orientation here. We're going to call this superior and this here inferior. Why? Well, because Remember that lymph always travels in one direction. And lymph in the lymph node always enters through the convex side and always leaves through the out the concave side, through the concave side. It's all it always travels this way. Now, you, that's easy to remember because well this is kind of in the shape of a heart. Most of our lymph nodes do uh, uh, are oriented like this because most of the lymph, since lymph gets dumped in the, into the subclavians, which is in the heart, the heart is towards the top of the body, therefore most of our lymph nodes uh, are, sh are oriented this direction because everything is, most of the body is below the heart. Does that make sense? And remember, it's, it's, they're always going from your toe all the way up to the heart. Therefore, this here is superior. Lymph generally travels, will travel like this. All right, so what are these guys called then? Since these are going towards, you should know this now, since these are going towards, these are your afferent, these are your afferent lymphatic vessels. And these, and these guys are your efferent lymphatic vessels, leaving the, the lymph node. All right, so remember you have your afferent going towards, and remember what do they carry? They carry dirty lymph towards the, the lymph node, and then your efferent lymphatic vessels carry lymph away from the, carry clean lymph away from the lymph node. All right, let's kind of continue here. And we got we have our cells. We got a, a shell here. We have some invaginations like this. Okay. And and then we have germinal centers. These are your germinal centers here. And then we have the medulla. We're just going to circle it here so you have an idea. This is the medulla. And from here to here, we have all this is the cortex. This is the cortex. Well, from this point to this point, 
This is more specifically the inner cortex. And then all the rest of this here is the outer cortex. All right, so once again, we have the medulla here. The cortex is all the rest of this, but the outer cortex is basically consists of this germinal center here and a little bit here, and then you have the inner cortex inside here. All the lymph that travels, when it travels, it does this, and it goes through the outer cortex, inner cortex, medulla, and then finally out the efferent. So let's write down the different cells that we find throughout the lymph node. The outer cortex contains and in the germinal center contains B cells, follicular dendritic cells, and then finally macrophages. And then in the, the, the rest of the outer cortex here outside of the germinal center, um, you could say outside, outside germinal center, you also have B cells. Then you have the inner cortex Let's do some boxing in here to keep this organized. And then in the inner cortex, we have <coughs> we have we will find T cells and dendritic cells. dendritic cells. Okay, and then finally in the medulla, sometimes it can be pronounced med medulla, but, and then finally in the medulla we have, we will find B cells, plasma cells, and macrophages. Okay, there we have it. So to recap one more time, you have the outer cortex, and inside the outer cortex you have the germinal center, you have B cells, dendritic cells, and macrophages. Then outside here you have some B cells. Then in the inner cortex here we will find T cells and dendritic cells. And finally in the medulla you have more B cells and more macrophages, and then you also find some uh, plasma cells. Generally, as lymph moves from this direction to this direction, it always hits the outer cortex, then the inner cortex, then the medulla, and then out. So before we get into talking about the different organs of the lymphatic system, I think it's appropriate to talk about what are the primary lymphatic organs or tissues and what are the secondary lymphatic organs or tissues. So there are two primary lymphatic organs or, or tissues. The thymus, that little gland that sits on top of the heart, and then secondary, your bone marrow. Why are they called primary? Because this is where immature um, lymphocytes first develop. And then for your secondary lymphatic organs, this is your, your lymph nodes, your spleen, your Peyer's patches. And why are they called secondary lymphatic 
organs or, or, or tissues, because then though, where those lymphocytes were first developed, they, they then migrate to the secondary lymphatic organs to carry out their antigenic attack. The spleen, like the lymph node, is a secondary lymphatic organ, but the lymph node has lymph flowing through it. The spleen has blood flowing through it, and that's how it, it receives its lymphocytes and macrophages. The lymphocytes, the B cells and T cells, that's, where they, that's one place where they carry out their immune functions, just like in, in lymph nodes, exactly the same. Uh, and then the macrophages there, they, they're able to destroy blood-borne pathogens by phagocytosis. That's what you have in the white pulp. Also in the, the red pulp of the spleen, you have where you have red blood cells, macrophages, lymphocytes, and plasma cells. Well, macrophage, macrophages also remove worn out red blood cells and platelets but also they store up to a third of the body's platelets. This is also important. Lymphatic nodules now, not lymph nodes, but nodules, are egg-shaped pieces of tissue, but are not surrounded by any kind of capsule. Two examples of lymphatic nodules are your pyrus patches in the ileum of the small intestine, and also you have your tonsils. We actually have five tonsils that form a ring at the junction of the oral cavity and nasopharynx. These are strategically positioned to be close by to the inhaled or ingested pathogens that we take in. This way, they can carry out swift immune attacks against foreign substances. Some people suffer from enlarged palatine and pharyngeal tonsils. The pharyngeal are also referred to as the adenoids. Sometimes people will go for a tonsillectomy as it's sometimes the best option when they're constantly becoming infected or with children who find it hard to, to eat or sleep. The tonsils are supposed to defend against pathogens, but in some people they, over, they can overreact and then begin to enlarge and very seldomly do they ever return in size, unfortunately. So you ask, well, if I, if I remove my tonsils, that that are supposed to defend me against foreign invaders. Getting rid of them, I mean, won't this cause me to contract more infections? Well, the answer is, there really is no definitive data showing if a tonsillectomy really causes increased infections over time. There are a few pub published studies out there, but there, are really, th th there really is no consensus among the, the, the medical community. And you still have your lingual tonsil, tonsil as well. You, you kind of have to weigh it out. Do you want to suffer kind of a lot for the rest of your life with little chance they ever shrink again? Or do you want to suffer a lot, a lot, but just for like a week, maybe two weeks? That's the unfortunate question these people have to face. Very good. Part two is innate immunity. And for this part, I'm going to write everything for innate immunity down on one sheet of paper. And I think it'll be really helpful if you do the same. And you can pause kind of whenever you need. Innate immunity refers to nonspecific defense mechanisms that come into play immediately or within hours of an antigen's appearance in the body. So nonspecific defenses. And there are two com you, can, you can think of it as, as having two components. First is the skin. Nothing gets through the skin. Nothing. You can never get sick through the skin unless the skin is broken. All that keratinized epithelia keeps us from getting sick. The second is mucous membranes, or you could say mucosa, which is epithelia and then the underlying you know, connective tissue. And, there's two, and it does two things. Number one, A is it traps pathogens, and B, it hydrates tissue. Traps pathogens and hydrates tissue. Now, where do we in the body not have um, keratinized? Where do we have non-keratinized uh, uh, epithelia? Wherever that is, that's where we have mucous membranes. We're talking the mouth, the pharynx, the larynx, the trachea. You know, in the trachea, we have the, the mucous escalator. Um, this, this traps pathogens, 
And then you have the cilia of the pseudostratified uh, columnar epithelia that sweep the, the mucus up, 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 and then we swallow, goes down our esophagus at where, the, where the acid in our stomach kills anything. That's the trachea. We also have in our eyes, we, it, this is considered uh, mucous membranes. But it's a different kind of uh, 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 fluid. Eyes secrete lysozyme containing tears that break down the walls of some bacteria. We also have the mouth. Mouth secretes saliva. The urethra. This makes urine. Vagina, vaginal secretions. And the anus. All these things are there because these tissues are not keratinized and they cannot dry out. If the skin breaks for some reason, if mucous membranes dry out, anything like that, no problem. We have the second line of defense. Second line of defense. So let's write that out. If pathogens get past our first line of defense, they will encounter the second line of defense. And there are five components. There are five main components. First, we have antimicrobial substances like interferons, or you can say IFNs. Lymphocytes, macrophages, fibroblasts make these IFN proteins when, 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 they're in, when they get infected with viruses, like coronavirus. So let's put make IFNs, IFN proteins when infected with viruses, just like with coronavirus. Let's just write a little, a little uh, depict it with a little picture here. Say you got a, a, a lymphocyte here, and you got a little coronavirus right here. Corona meaning crown. It, lo it looks like a crown in the microscope. That's why it's called coronavirus. Well, the lymphocyte then will start to make these IFNs. So what? So what does it do? Well, it releases them to nearby cells. And then you can have one of three scenarios then that nearby cells uh, will, will respond to. So let's draw out three cells. You got little receptors on them and then they, they, they're, they're receiving now these, these antimicrobial substances, these, these IFNs. First thing that can happen, these IFNs signals neighboring uninfected cells to reduce protein synthesis. How do viruses work? They bind, they hijack the cell, and they, they use the machinery to make more and more and more, more and more of their copies. So if you can reduce protein synthesis, you can slow down these viruses. Second is these IFNs signal infected neighboring cells to undergo apoptosis, apoptosis or programmed cell death, apoptosis. So infected cells will basically start to die off. Very simple. Third thing these IFNs do is they activate immune cells. 
Very good. Second part. Number two, we got natural killer cells. Natural killer cells are about 5 to 10% of the lymphocytes in our blood. Natural killer cells. And again, these are nonspecific. Nonspecific. They're going around. They're looking for problems. They're looking for issues. They're looking for... Um, um, uh, uh, for protein receptors on on all of our body cells, but they're not but but they're not looking for a specific strain of any virus or a specific strain of of any uh, bacteria. These guys are made in the spleen, lymph nodes, and red bone marrow. All right, let's draw out some. Let's draw out three different scenarios. Three different scenarios can occur with these natural killer cells. They can, three different things can happen. So first, let's draw out a natural killer cell here. You have an activation receptor here. And then, and then you have a, uh, a receptor protein. And then over here, we got a body cell. So these are one of our, any one of our cells. Now, our own body cells they only can produce what we call MHC1 protein receptors. MHC1. This means that, uh, that they are showing an endogenous peptide. MHC1. What is that endogenous peptide? It puts the bo our body cells put this endogenous peptide on top of the MHC1 protein to show that nothing is wrong or to show that something is wrong. Here's our activation receptor right here. Now this is a, a, an example of a healthy, uh, a, a, a healthy, healthy body cell. For the second scenario, let's do another one. Natural killer cell. You got your activation receptor, the other receptor. Got our body cell right here. and our little protein. But this time, this endogenous peptide that's on top of our MHC1 protein is abnormal. This signals the natural killer cell to start to produce cytokines to call for help and also to initiate an attack. There is another scenario that can occur so we have our natural killer cell again, our receptors. We got our body cell over here. But this time, there is no MHC1 protein. This means that the, this body cell is sick, just like in our second example. So you could have a healthy scenario, making an MHC1 with a normal peptide. You can have a, an MHC1 protein with an abnormal endogenous peptide, or you can have our body cells without making any MHC1, and this would also be a sick, uh, a, a sick body cell. In the last two cases, the natural killer cell then will initiate uh, uh, um, these, these body cells to be destroyed, and there's, there's three steps to do this. First, it releases perforin and granzymes. Perforin to meaning uh, coming from the word perforate. It'll then the cell then undergoes cytolysis and apoptosis. Cytolysis, like to, to break apart, or programmed cell death. So what is this perforin? Natural killer cells release these, like they're like straws. They're literally like, like little straws that they jab into the plasma membrane of our own body cells. Then it makes granzymes, releases them into the uh, you know, out, out extracellular fluid. They, they enter the body cells and start tearing up the, the, the body cell and undergoing cytolysis. Our body cells also make MHC2 proteins, um, and these would be an example of exogenous. This would, and on top of 
that protein would be an exogenous peptide. <coughs> but natural killer cells don't know how to respond to those MHC2 proteins. All right, very good. So we got healthy, sick, and sick. Three different scenarios that can occur. Now, it's important to know that over our, our trillions of cells, sorry, our trillions of cells have the ability to participate in our immune defense mechanisms, our own, because they are making these MHC1 proteins. And therefore, they're helping these natural killer cells to undergo attacks if they need. Yes, our own body cells will end up dying, but that's better than every one of our body cells dying. Our body cells make MHC1 and display endogenous peptides. They also make MHC2 putting an exogenous peptide on top of the MHC2, but natural killer cells can't recognize that. They only deal with uh, MHC1. Very good. The third component are phagocytes, eating, cells that eat. For the second line of defense, we have neutrophils. These guys, these are the, the, the highest number of white blood cells. 60 to 70% of white blood cells are neutrophils. Generally, you'll find them in bacterial infections or in um, inflammation. These guys, in the short version is they eat and then they self-destruct. These are like the suicide bombers. They eat and self-destruct. There is another cell that's also a phagocyte, macrophages. Macrophages also eat and spit, but they also take a piece and present it to B and T cells. So that means that macrophages are an antigen-presenting cell. We'll get to that a little bit later. There's another type of phagocyte, but for, but for, for the in, uh, second line of defense for innate, we're only going to deal with two. Well, monocytes become macrophages. Monocytes differentiate into macrophages during migration to tissues. Monocytes become macrophages. All right, so there are five steps to how these phagocytes end up destroying the, the pathogens. Five steps. First is by positive chemotaxis. They sense chemicals coming from the inflammation or from the trouble and they are attracted by using these chemicals. It's called, by, it's called positive chemotaxis. That's how they know where to go. Second is adherence. This is where they will bind to the foreign pathogen. Then ingest. They will take it in. Their pseudopods sort of reach out and take it in. Phagocytosis. Fourth, digestion. You got lysozymes breaking away, destroying. And then finally, of course, they will, fifth, they will kill the, um, the, the, the foreign invader. One, two, three, four, five. Fifth one is killing. Fifth one, fifth step is killing. The fourth component is inflammation. Inflammation. This can occur from pathogens, abrasions, chemical irritations, distortion of the skin, that sort of thing. And I think we all are familiar with the the four cardinal signs of inflammation. 
You know what they are? Swelling, redness, heat, and lastly, pain. It's really an attempt to dispose microbes to prevent their spread to the rest of the body. Almost done with, with innate. Almost done. Last one. Lastly is fever. Our hypothalamus resets our temperature to increase, increase, increase. When we get the chills, yet we're on fire, you ever notice that? Why are we ever, you know, we're like 104 degrees, yet, we, we, yet we're, we're shivering. Why is that? Because the hypothalamus is saying, oh no, I'm cold. We need to get even hotter and hotter. This, this, this is, um, there's an advantage to this. This can occur from bacteria, toxins, and it elevates the body temperature. It intensifies the effects of IFNs. It inhibits growth of certain pathogens. And it speeds up catalytic processes in our body, enzymes to, to, to quicken the healing process. And that's it. Here's the whole thing. Here's the whole thing from, from beginning to end. Very good. I know it's a lot, but you're doing really good. Okay, now that we've covered everything up in the innate immunity, now we're going to move on to adaptive immunity. And this is really the, 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 the last piece of the puzzle. So what exactly is it? It's the, it's, ad adaptive immunity is the ability to defend against specific strains of invading agents like bacteria or toxins or viruses, that sort of thing. And any substance that is recognized as foreign and provokes an immune response, we call that an antigen. I know that in previous chapters we were talking about antigens on red blood cells. Antigen really is just a protein, but here we're, 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 we're referring to foreign substances, foreign, foreign particles. The two properties that distinguish adaptive immunity from innate immunity is specificity and memory. Specificity for particular antigens, which also involves distinguishing self from non-self. And the second thing is memory for most previously encountered antigens so that a second encounter can prompt an even more rapid response. What are the two cells that we're going to be talking about with um, uh, with, uh, well, there's, there's three cells. What are the three cells? We have T cells, B cells, which these are your lymphocytes, T cells, B cells, and your, and your dendritic cells, your follicular dendritic cells. Well, with cell mediated adaptive immunity, we're, we're going to, uh, what the, the cell that's involved is your, are your T cells, your cytotoxic T cells and your helper T cells. In cell-mediated adaptive immunity, cytotoxic T cells directly attack invading antigens and is particularly effective against intracellular pathogens like bacteria and viruses as well as cancer cells. Cell-mediated Im immunity always involves cells attacking cells. What do they do? They leave secondary lymphatic organs and tissues after being triggered after after being triggered they then leave the secondary lymphatic organs and tissues migrate to seek and destroy infected target cells and cancer cells they first recognize and then attach to target cells then they del deliver a lethal hit that kills sort of like how natural killer cells do but cytotoxic t cells have receptors specific for a particular microbe and thus kill only sp specific body cells they really kill the same way that natural killer cells do that we already saw. But really the difference is, is that natural killer cells are just roaming around the body all the time looking for abnormal or, or missing MHC1. 
um, uh, re recept uh, uh, protein receptors. But cytotoxic T cells are looking for a very, very, very specific strain. How do they even know to look for that? Well, we're going to get to that. We're going to see how that works. But first, let's do a little bit of overview on the antibody-mediated adaptive immunity. Here, B cells become plasma cells, and plasma cells make antibodies. So B cells become plasma cells, and plasma cells make antibodies. This immunity works against extracellular pathogens like bacteria and viruses, and since antibody-mediated immunity always involves antibodies binding to antigens in body humors, it's also called humoral immunity. You see the difference between cell-mediated and antibody-mediated? Now we're not talking, it's, it's obviously it's still a cell that's involved, they're B cells, but B cells become plasma cells and then, it's, and then plasma cells make antibodies and it's the antibodies that actually do the, the attacking. For the first encounter, initially there's only a small group of lymphocytes like helper T cells and cytotoxic T cells and B cells, just a small amount with the correct antigen receptors to respond to a particular antigen upon the first encounter. There's only a, f there, 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 there's only a few. Cell-mediated and antibody-mediated immune responses often work together because generally there will be large copies of that particular antigen. Because the large number of antigens initially outnumber the small group of helper T and cytotoxic T cells and B cells with the correct antigen receptor to respond. When they encounter and receive stimulatory cues, they undergo what's called clonal selection, which, is, which occur in the secondary lymphatic organs and tissues. And then they proliferate and differentiate, forming more highly specialized cells in response, making clones, and now able to recognize the same specific antigen as the original lymphocyte. The result of cloning is often your swollen tonsils or, or lymph nodes. How do B cells have the capability of recognizing and cloning cells that will react to specific antigens? If there are millions upon millions of different bacteria and viruses, not to mention the ever-evolving microbes. Well, each B cell has 10,000 identical membrane-bound antibodies. We usually draw four or five when we, when we, when we draw antibodies. During development, B cells recombine bits of proteins that make up the antibody receptor, and the result is virtually unlimited combinations. There are 10 to the 10 different combinations of variable portions on each antibody. Every B cell is slightly different from the next. No matter, that's, that's the reason why, no matter how many times bacteria will mutate and mutate and mutate or viruses will mutate and mutate and mutate we still are able to recognize that specific antigen because though because of the of this recombination there are literally 10 to the 10 different combinations of variable portions on each antibody next helper T cells become active helper T cells, cytotoxic T cells become active cytotoxic T cells, and B cells become plasma cells. These generally die when the immune response is no longer needed. Memory helper T cells and memory cytotoxic T cells and memory B cells do not actively participate in the initial response, but if the same antigen encounters the body again later on, memory cells are available to initiate a far swifter reaction than the first by proliferating and differentiating into more memory cells and more T cells and more B cells. That's how it works. Because there are now more specific memory cells floating around, they are more likely to bump into the respective antigen and thus a quicker immune response results. 
The second response is so fast that the antigen is destroyed before any signs or symptoms of disease can occur. What is the pathway of antigen processing? What is the pathway? Well, dendritic cells and macrophages and B cells are called antigen presenting cells. Dendritic cells, macrophages, and B cells are called antigen presenting cells. They present antigenic proteins by first ingesting, they eat up the peptides, they eat up, they break it up, they make an MHC2 protein, shove it on the top of their membrane, and then they put the that antigen on top of that MHC2 protein. So again, when they encounter a foreign bacteria or virus, they first take it in, they ingest it by, phago by, by, by um, endocytosis, they, eat, they break it up, break up the protein, they split it up into little peptides, then they make an MHC2 the reason why is because it's foreign where it's it's a foreign um, it's a foreign uh, uh, it's a foreign antigen or exogenous antigen then they take this MHC2 protein they put it on the surface of their own plasma membrane then they take a little piece of peptide from the, the virus and they put it up on top of the MHC2 protein and this way T cells will be able to recognize this. So they're going to present, they're going to present, they're going to migrate, they're going to go back to the lymph nodes and they're going to present it to the, um, to the, to, to the, to the, to the T cells. And then the T cells then will recognize that, recognize that it's foreign, then they'll start proliferating and proliferating, and then they'll migrate out of the lymph nodes, and that's and, and, and then they'll start looking around for that one specific um, antigen. That's, that's how T cells are looking for a specific, that's how they know how to, how to look for that specific T cell, is by these these uh, dendritic cells, macrophages, and B cells. These guys are really the link between innate immunity and adaptive immunity. The antigen presenting cell migrates to the lymphatic tissue to present the antigen to specific helper T cells. What's amazing is that every single one of our own body cells is actively involved in immunity. How? Well, because every one of our own body cells, they kind of do the same thing. They recognize a cancer cell or an infection. They, when it's when 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 uh, when when they ingest it, they split the the antigen up into little peptides. But this time, they make an MHC one protein, put it up on top of their plasma membrane, and then they put the, a little piece of that peptide on top of the MHC1 and these cells will then wait because obviously our body cell, most of our body cells can't move around. They wait for cytotoxic T cells to come to them. Then they present the antigen to specific T cells which can proliferate and differentiate into more helper T cells and cytotoxic T cells to kill each infected cell just like we saw before. When an antigen binds to the B cell receptor, it becomes activated. It then undergoes clonal selection and the result are plasma cells and memory B cells. Plasma cells secrete hundreds of millions of antibodies for four to five days. Memory B cells quickly pro proliferate and differentiate into more memory B cells and more plasma cells. An antibody can combine specifically with the epitope on the antigen that is triggered, that triggered its production. The antibody fits with the antigen like a locket key. Antibodies belong to a group of glycoproteins called globulins, and this is why they, this is where they get their name, immunoglobulins. 
What's amazing is that these plasma cells can synthesize 2,000 antibodies a second. Imagine. There are free antibodies and there are bound antibodies. Some antibodies can freely roam in the bloodstream and bind to and hinder a pathogen from carrying out an attack on the body because there is now a big protein complex attached to it. Opsonization is the process by which a pathogen is marked for ingestion and eliminated by a phagocyte. There, th there's another option where you have free antibodies. These guys can also bind to several pathogens and agglutinate. We've already seen this in the blood chapter. Other antibodies, when synthesized, will stay attached to the surface of B cells. And then finally, some antibodies can attach to mast cells, preparing them for a possible second allergy attack. All right, really quickly, let's do a little bit about allergies. And I really have just two questions for you. Number one, what is allergies? And the answer is, it's, re it's, it's an overreaction of the immune system to something that's generally not that dangerous. And it's the protein that's found in these different substances, like peanut butter or strawberries or what have you. It's an overreaction of the immune system to something that's usually not that dangerous. And the second question is, why do they usually increase over time? Why do allergies increase the symptoms over time? I mean, usually when we get exposed to some kind of virus or bacteria, we become immune over time. Our, our, we have memory T cells and B cells that are made and they float around in the body. Why is it that with allergies, we, we incre the, inc the symptoms increase upon exposure? Why is it that with the first exposure, we, don't, we may not have any symptoms, and then the second exposure, we have a lot of symptoms, and the next, we have even more and more and more? Why? And the answer is, it all has to do with the mast cells. It's, it's the mast cells. The mast cells release histamine. And histamine is a chemical that when it reaches the blood, the, the blood, it increases vasodilation, which increases the rate at which our, the rest of the white blood cells can come and come to the attack, come to, to uh, come to, 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 to save the day. And histamine also increases the permeability of those blood vessels. That way, every, uh, that way, the, uh, the, the, the allergen can be um, dealt with more quickly. But why is it that mast cells, why is it that we have, um, that we have, that we increase in uh, symptoms over time? Why don't the mast cells do it upon first exposure? Well, the answer is because they're not, uh, they're, they're not, um, they're not equipped. <clears throat> they're not equipped yet. They, when, when an allergen reaches the mast cells, they, 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 they have nothing, they have no receptor to receive those. They can't even recognize it. They're not sensitive to that particular allergen. First thing that happens is that the B cells make plasma cells. Plasma cells make antibodies, and the antibodies bind to those mast cells. And now the mast cells, equipped with those antibodies, are now able to be sensitive and receive those allergens. <clears throat> now, if it happens again, those mast cells will release histamine and you will have an allergic, uh, uh, you will trigger an, an, an inflammatory response. So one more time, why is it that upon first exposure, you don't have any kind of symptom? Well, because with first exposure, the mast cells can't release anything because they're not sensitive. But something does happen. B cells make plasma cells, and plasma cells make, mass, make, make antibodies, and the antibodies bind to the mast cells. And then, and now the mast cells are, are, are ready to go for, in case of a second attack. Upon second exposure, now the mast cells are sensitive 
with those uh, uh, to those allergens because they now have those antibodies that the plasma cells made and now when they when they are exposed to those allergens again they are they are able to receive them recognize them and then they release histamine and then and and triggers uh, an inflammatory response that's allergies in a nutshell very good you guys I know we did a lot I know it's gonna take a lot of studying a lot of organizing a lot of processing but I have one more tool to help you through this chapter I'm gonna make a table here and I want you to follow along as well I want you to make the same thing so you can just pause it for a second and uh, and then and then restart it how are all of these cells linked to each other how are they related how are they different what are their functions what do they look like where do they come from all these things we're gonna to try to get it all on on, uh, on on one table here okay all right let's start natural killer cells T cells and B cells <coughs> are all lymphocytes lymphocytes These are all lymphocytes. Dendritic cells and macrophages are and your B cells are all antigen presenting cells these are your antigen presenting cells <clears throat> in other words these are the link between the innate and the adaptive immunities they present they they capture foreign antigens they engulf they uh, phagocytize and engulf foreign invaders migrate out of the tissues back into the lymph nodes where they will present to T's to T cells and more B cells these are your antigen presenting cells we also have neutrophils <clears throat> and we have basophils we also have eosinophils and we also have mast cells these are all the cells of the of the uh, of the immune system <coughs> well how are basophils eosinophils and mast cells um, related these guys are all involved in allergies It might not come out too well on your screen, so I'll try to. These guys make histamine. The 
these guys make histamine. How are how are neutrophils and macrophages and dendritic cells really um, related? These guys are phagocytes. We were saying before that they're just neutrophils and macrophages. Actually, even, den even dendritic cells So, and we have monocytes, and we have monocytes. Monocytes are what differentiate into macrophages and dendritic cells. So let's do it like this. could even put a little arrow to show differentiation. They become they become these are what become macrophages and and dendritic cells. <coughs> So if we want to circle these or kind of kind of do this just to emphasize And the monocytes and your lymphocytes. And your basophils, eosinophils, and mast cells. So what do these guys look like? What do these guys look like? Well, your lymphocytes, these are the smallest. These are the smallest. They look like they're the same size as your red blood cells. They look like a discolored red blood cell. They're roughly the same size. Actually, maybe I should make it kind of... I mean, in the microscope. And let's put um, little receptors on on these guys, remember your your little uh, antibodies. <coughs> and how about your dendritic cells? Well, these guys, they have little, they got dendrites. Dendrology is the study of trees. There's your dendrites, dendritic cells. 
your macrophage, your monocytes, you know, these guys, these are the largest. Your monocyte and your and your lymphocyte, these guys are the two agranular cells. Um, these are the smallest of, this, of the white blood cells. These are the largest of the white blood cells. Your neutrophil, these, those have those four to six lobes of nuclei. They look kind of look like this. They're kind of like connected. The, the, you know, I have like four to six lobes. And your, your basophils, these are, they're generally like in the microscope, they're usually so filled with granules. Remember these guys, they have the histamine that you can't even see the nucleus. They're usually like this. That's usually what they look like. I mean, it just looks like a big mess. You can't even see plasma or, or the nucleus or anything like that. <clears throat> um, and eosinophils, these guys are more red. Usually they're bilobed like this, pretty pink. But these are also granular. So let's make... So let's make little granules. And and also your um, and also your mast cells. And also your mast cells. forgot about the neutrophils. These are all granular. The only ones that are agranular are your um, are your lymphocytes and your um, your monocytes here. Okay, very good. So that's that. <clears throat> all right, so let's do a little bit about let's do a little bit of info here. Um, Mast cells, these are involved in allergies. Allergies here for eosinophils, for basophils, allergies. Neutrophils, these are the first responders. To inflammation. They're, they're, they're floating around in the tissues. They're, they're, they're looking for problems. They're floating around. These are also involved in bacterial infections. Um, your macrophages, remember these are macrophages are antigen presenting cells. Your macrophages, but they're also phagocytes. They eat spit and present you know to your to your to your T cells your dendritic cells also eat and present because they're antigen presenting cells <clears throat> they also have that MHC. They can also make the MHC2 protein, meaning that they can present an exogenous, exogenous um, uh, antigens. Your B cells, those guys, 
B cells become plasma cells. plasma cells, and those make antibodies. But also, th these are also antigen-presenting cells. So they can make the MHC2 protein as well. Your T cells, <clears throat> these guys can, these guys can make um, your, your MHC1, MHC2, MHC1, MHC2, um, these guys, remember, the, they, they make the, the perforin and the gran, granzymes, remember, remember? Just like the natural killer cells perforate like a straw. And your natural killer cells, they can detect you know, you have like one of three scenarios. Healthy, detecting normal MHC1. Um, abnormal MHC1 and missing or absent MHC1 proteins on our body cells. Who, where do you find MHC1 proteins? Where do you find them? You find them on our body cells. <coughs> Where do you find MHC2 proteins? You find them on these other cells because these cells can take in foreign antigens and then make an MHC2 protein, put the, uh, put the, the exogenous peptide on, uh, on that MHC2 protein and then present it to, uh, to your T cells. Okay. I think that's I think that's pretty good. Thank you everybody. Yeah. So I'd like to review just a couple of things here. These antigen presenting cells, where are they? Here they are. These guys, they're floating around in our tissues, just looking for general stuff. But every once in a while, they'll bump into foreign invaders um, from outside the body, not just strange stuff like cancer cells or whatever. And once they do, they will uh, engulf their phagocytes, they'll engulf, <coughs> make an MHC2 protein, put the exogenous uh, 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 peptide on top, then they'll migrate to the lymphatic system, migrate to the lymph nodes where they'll present to, your, to, to, to the T cells. T cells will then proliferate, they'll, they'll, they'll make a very specific um, um, receptors very specific to that particular um, uh, um, antigen 
that was presented to them that and that's again how those T cells and the B cells are are able to f to look for very specific um, very specific uh, antigens. Neutrophils are generally um, floating around. They're floating around the blood. They're floating around the, in the tissue, and uh, they're the first resp responders to inflammation. When you have a bacterial infection, neutrophils are 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 highly involved with bacterial infections. The pus, because these guys, um, because these guys. Um, eat oh I forgot to put it here these guys eat and self destruct the pus a lot of what the pus is that's those are neutrophils that white stuff you know white heads or anything like that that's because when you have inflammation and, uh, you know, whatever, you know, if, if uh, whatever something on your skin pops, that's, um, that's a lot of what pus is. Those, those are neutrophils. They're the first responders to inflammation. All right, the moment you've been waiting for. So I got five good test questions for you. Um, pause it if you want. I'll, I'll wait just a couple seconds, but you can pause it whatever if you want. Um, um, all right, so here we go. Number one. If one of our body cells displays no MHC protein at all on its surface, which cell can detect this as abnormal? Which cell usually uh, detects this ab as abnormal? A, the, a B cell, B, a T cell, C, a natural killer cell, or D, plasma cell? B cell, T cell, natural killer cell, plasma cell? Answer is C, natural killer cell that can detect no MHC uh, protein on the cell surface. Second question is which cells make antibodies? Which cells make antibodies? Plasma cells, B lymphocytes, B cells, cytotoxic T cells, macrophages, or neutrophils? Plasma cells, B cells, cytotoxic T cells, macrophages, neutrophils. Which ones make antibodies? Answer, plasma cells. Plasma cells make antibodies. Plasma cells. All right, number three. Which of the following belongs to the adaptive immunity? Which of the following belongs to the adaptive immunity? Skin, mucous membranes, B cells, macrophages, or neutrophils? Adaptive immunity, skin, mucous membranes, B cells, macrophages, or neutrophils? Answer, B cells, B cells. <clears throat> and I, got, I guess I got a bonus question for you. B cells, do they belong to the humoral immunity or cell-mediated immunity? If you remember, humoral or cell-mediated? Answer, humoral, B cells, humoral. All right, number four, which of the following belongs to innate? Which of the following belongs to the innate immunity? Are we talking neutrophils, helper T cells, memory B cells, or killer T cells? Innate immunity, innate immunity. Neutrophils, neutrophils belong to the innate immunity. They're, they're general. They're looking for general, um, general pathogens. And, or inflammation or what have you. And finally, the last question I have for you. Which of the following collects lymph from the legs? Which of the following collects lymph from the legs? The thymus gland, the right 
subclavian vein, the thoracic duct, or all of the above? Which of the following collects lymph from the legs? Thymus, the right subclavian vein, thoracic duct, or all of the above? The answer is the thoracic duct. The thoracic duct. Thank you guys very much for your patience. You made it. You deserve a break. Go take a break. And then come back and time to study. Process and, uh, and study over and over and over. Study three different ways if you can. And uh, the sooner you do it, the more exposure you'll have. You're... you're uh, you're, you're going to have to take the test, so uh, the earlier you do it, the better off you'll be. Thank you guys very much for watching, and we'll see you next time.